I know that we've heard those words many times before, especially if you've grown up in church. But those are shocking words that Gabriel told to Mary. What, what would you have felt hearing Mary say those words? What would you have thought or hearing Gabriel speak those words? If you were Mary, put yourself in Mary's shoes, as Luke said. What would you have felt? What would you have thought? What would you have done if you were Mary? I don't know if you remember, there was a, a Christmas card a few years back. I love getting those Christmas cards. Uh, we, we put them up on our cabinets in our kitchen and we tape them up so you can see all of your beautiful faces and your beautiful families. We pray for you guys. There's a Christmas card. Some of them have, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season or they have a picture of the three wise men or something like that. There was one year where there was a, a picture of this scene. You could see the, the glowing glory of of Gabriel shining in the background and Mary just kind of looking at him and you could see the side of her face and she just looked so calm and peaceful and happy. And Luke tells us that's not what happened at all. She was perplexed, troubled, afraid. And so I want to ask the question, as we just meditate on Christmas this morning, I want to ask the question, what would you do what would you have done if you were in her shoes? How would you have responded? And why would you have responded that way? I want to ask that question of the text because I think the text tells us, it explicitly tells us what Mary did upon receiving that news. And then I think by implication, we can see why she did that in this and other texts. So if you have your copy of God's word, turn with me to Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one, we will begin reading in verse 39, which is the next verse after the verse that Luke read. After the angel Gabriel departs from Mary, verse 39, Luke chapter 1, verse 39 picks up the story. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry. She ran to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Father, thank you for this time that we have to meditate on Christmas, on the reality of Emmanuel, God with us. He is born, hope for all. We are hopeless apart from him. So Father, I pray that you would be pleased to show us Christ. Holy Spirit, open our eyes that we would behold wonderful things from your law in such a way that we would see, receive, and go and tell that we would not remain unaffected by this text. That it would change even the interactions that we live out today after our time in your word. We love you. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So what does Mary do? Immediately after receiving this news, she hurries, she runs, she goes immediately. Different translations translate it differently with in a hurry, running immediately. There's this sense of urgency. I need to go be with Elizabeth. So we know what she does explicitly. That's what she does. She travels from Galilee in the north all the way down to the south, about 70 mile journey. We know exactly what she does. But my question is, why does she do this? Why does she do this? The text doesn't explicitly tell us. But I think from this text and other texts that we can kind of zip up together and harmonize gospel accounts, I think that we can, by implication, see a couple reasons why. Four reasons why she urgently ran to Elizabeth. Four amazing reasons of the, the companionship that we have in the gospel. The reasons why fellowship is a necessity. Four things that she was seeking from Elizabeth that I think that she would have found. Number one, 
She wanted someone who understood. She wanted somebody who understood. She wanted to be with someone who understood, who would not reject her or spurn her. She wanted to be with somebody who understood. If you go back to verse 34, Mary asks Gabriel, how can this be? How can I be pregnant? I'm a virgin. How can I be pregnant? And the angel Gabriel responds by saying, Elizabeth was barren and advanced in years. There was no possible way she was going to get pregnant. And yet she is pregnant right now. She who was barren is now in her sixth month. Everyone had written Elizabeth off as being cursed by God. Barrenness back then was a symbol for people to look upon and say, they must be cursed of God. That's wrong. It was an incorrect way to view it. But they would look upon Elizabeth and say, something you did or something your parents did, you are cursed by God. And yet here Elizabeth is six months Pregnant with John the Baptist, with the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who's going to go prepare the way for Messiah. Unbelievable that God would do this with Elizabeth. We always say when God's doing one thing, he's doing a billion things. So we can't pinpoint and say why there's one specific reason that God chose to do this. But I think in the announcement of the forerunner to the Messiah and the hope that the Messiah was going to bring, how much more hopeless of a situation can you get with Elizabeth being barren all of her life and advanced in years? And yet Gabriel says to Mary, he quotes Genesis 18 verse 14 about Sarah in her old age being given a son, the son of the promise. Nothing is impossible with God. And so knowing that, Mary says, if I go to Elizabeth, I'm gonna find someone who understands. I'm gonna find someone who says, I get it. I know it seems impossible, but I know that it's possible because it seemed impossible for me and yet God did it for me. Unusual births are one of God's fortes. He loves doing this. And Elizabeth just received this and so since Mary's receiving this news, she says, I want to be with somebody who understands. Maybe Elizabeth, when Mary showed up at her doorstep, would have said, can you believe what God has done for us? We're in this together. Can you believe this miracle? What God has done to us, for us, through us. With tears streaming down her face to say, Mary, we're going to be moms. We didn't think this was possible, and yet it's happening. Elizabeth absolutely would have understood. And that's why Mary goes to be with her. But not everyone's going to understand what's happening to Mary. Elizabeth is going to get it, but practically everyone else around Mary isn't going to get it. And that's why I think the second reason why Mary goes to Elizabeth happens. Number one, Mary wants somebody who understands. That's the beauty of fellowship, friendship, and companionship. You can be with somebody who gets you, who understands you. But number two, Mary knows that Elizabeth is someone who can give peace in the midst of fear. Mary knows that Elizabeth is somebody who can bring peace in the midst of fear. Mary cried out, how can this be? She asked Gabriel, how is this possible? How am I going to be able to explain this? Can you explain it to me? And how can I explain it to other people? How is she going to broach this subject with her parents? Hey, mom, dad, I have some news for you. I'm pregnant, but it's not what you think. It's an angel who told me it's the Holy Spirit. How is she going to explain this? Will anybody believe her? Just think even of this journey. She's going to go from the north of Israel all the way down to the south of Israel. It's about a 70, 70 mile journey. Who's going to go with her? She's a teenager, so she's probably not going to go alone. But at the same time, who's going to go with her? Who's going to believe the, the story that she's telling? Is family going to go with her? Probably mom and dad say, I, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't think she's going alone. Maybe she caravans with other people to be safe. We don't know anything about how Jesus' grandparents responded, how they would have felt over this news. But we do have a little glimpse of how they would have responded. We do have a little glimpse of maybe their attitude. You remember Luke chapter 2? It was already read for us this morning. Remember, Joseph has to go to his uh, place of birth, his hometown for the census, which is Bethlehem. 
and they travel, Mary and Joseph, to Bethlehem, and there is where Jesus is going to be born. And we know that familiar verse of going to the, the inn, and there's no room for them in the inn. Uh, Kelly read a, a great translation of that word. That word for inn, the Greek word kataluma, it, it's better translated guest room. It's a, it's a room, a, a part of a home that you would know. It's not some random you pay for a place to stay. There is a specific Greek word for that. And Luke actually uses that in Luke chapter 10 when he's talking about the Good Samaritan. You remember the Good Samaritan uh, takes um, the, the beat up Jewish man who's left half dead and brings him on his donkey to an inn, pays the innkeeper money and says, stay here and keep this man safe. If Luke wanted to say, this is a place where, you know, there's a no vacancy sign, that's typically what we think of when we think of no room in the inn. But that's not what's being said here. Joseph isn't going to a hotel in Bethlehem. Joseph is going to his hometown, probably going to where he grew up, probably going to his parents' house or his parents' parents' house. And as he shows up, it's not that there's no vacancy in this home. The word is guest room. This is just a place that's uh, alongside the, the home, alongside the house. Probably the room that he grew up in. Hey, mom and dad, are you using it? You know, maybe dad turned it into a man cave and has been watching football there. But can I, can I use it just because we're back home? The census has to happen. My wife is pregnant and they say, yeah, but how? When the scandal the absolute scandal. We don't believe you, Joseph. We don't believe you, Mary. So was there literally no vacancy? No. There's more than likely a room available for them. But what happens is the family bars the door and says, we're not going to participate in your lies. You were not made pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Stop the charade. Stop lying to us. And so they're kicked out. Just nine months of awkward explanations for Mary among just a lingering scandal that actually goes all the way into Jesus' life. John chapter 8, verse 41, the Pharisees say, you can't be the Messiah because you were born of fornication. You were born through an immoral relationship. So I think Mary, as she's pondering, how am I going to explain this? What am I going to do? She knows Elizabeth will believe me. Other people won't believe me. I know that this is going to be hard, but Elizabeth will believe me. She probably thought it would be profitable, consoling, steadying for her to confer with Elizabeth, who would give peace, calming assurance. I believe you, Mary, and I'll be with you. Elizabeth believes Mary. We see that in the text. Ultimately, she shares in her joy. But the scene poignantly highlights the contrast between Elizabeth and Mary. The whole countryside is talking about Elizabeth's healed womb, even as Mary is hiding the shame of the, the miracle taking place in her womb. In a few months, the birth of John the Baptist will take place. There will be great fanfare, uh, midwives, relatives doting on the new child, and the traditional village chorus celebrating the birth of a Jewish boy. Six months later, Jesus was going to be born and Far from home, no midwife, no extended family, no village chorus present. Often the works of God in our lives come with two edges, great joy and great pain. And yet Mary, upon hearing the news from Gabriel, says, I'm your slave and I will do exactly what you're asking me to do. She receives it. She's the first person to accept Jesus on his own terms, regardless of the personal cost. And it will cost her much. But she knows that a pain redeemed is much better than a pain removed. And so she gladly receives it. And in her fear and in her anxiety, she says, I want to go to Elizabeth because I know that she's going to help me. Maybe Elizabeth said, Mary, I don't know how all this is going to work out for us. In fact, I'm guessing that there are going to be people that are not going to believe you. But if God is the one doing this and he is good, then we can trust him if he is for us, then it doesn't matter who is against us. And she would steady her relative. Mary went to Elizabeth because 
She wanted someone who would understand. She would, wanted somebody who would bring peace in the midst of fear. Thirdly, she would want to go to somebody who would give comfort in the midst of sorrow. She would want to go to somebody who would give comfort in the midst of sorrow. Not only is there fear over all of these people around me, how am I going to respond? How am I going to speak to them? But there's also going to be great fear over the fact that what about Joseph? What is he going to say? And sorrow over the potential broken relationship between him. She would surely be ostracized by her community, and she was. For all Mary knew, she would be deserted and despised, wrongly so, but that's not going to change what would likely happen in her life. And as far as she could tell, she's risking every, everything to bear the Messiah. But I think her mind probably went straight to Joseph. How is he going to believe any of this? Luke chapter 1, verse 26, Mary is visited by the angel in Galilee, in Nazareth. In verse 39, she goes to the hill country down south. And then in verse 56, Mary, it says that Mary stays about three months. So with the journey down south to be with Elizabeth and then the journey back north to be with Joseph, she's gone for about four months. So when she heads back to Galilee, she's going to be showing the first time that she sees Joseph, the first time he sees his betrothed, he's going to give her a hug and say, what's going on? You need to explain yourself. You were gone for three months. What'd you do? You were unfaithful to me? Mary would have told him, don't worry. I understand. An angel appeared to me. God said that he would overshadow me and I would give birth to the Messiah. And we read, Sergio read for us this morning, that Joseph does not buy that. He hears this, he's, what is going on? I don't know if I believe this. And it takes Gabriel showing up again to Joseph to say, no, 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 what Mary said is true. I love the way that Chuck Swindoll describes Joseph receiving this news. He describes it from Joseph's perspective. He says, after describing a most unusual story, Mary revealed to me that she was pregnant. The words hit my chest like a boulder. I sat stunned as she continued with a preposterous, blasphemous story about conceiving the Messiah and the invisible God behaving in a manner that seemed to me like the deviant gods of Rome. A wave of questions flooded my mind. Who was the father? Was Mary taken advantage of or did she consent how could I have been so wrong about somebody I knew so well? Is she insane? Is she still in love with this guy? Does she not love me anymore? Why would she do this? I looked across the table at Mary to find her gazing at me with obvious compassion, which outraged me. Was her delusion so complete as to believe what she had said? Or worse, her deceit so profound as to feign concern for the lives that she's destroyed? The room began to spin and I felt my stomach rebel. I had to get outside. I nearly tore the door off its hinges. I ran into the night and I didn't stop until I stood on the ridge outside of Nazareth. Exhausted, I sank to my knees and sat for hours in the darkness, staring across the plain and into the night sky. When I was a child, I had found comfort in the vast expanse of stars, a symbol of God's power, permanence, and unchangeable character. So I found the appearance of a new light, a bright dot high above the horizon, a little unsettling. But my anguish would not allow any other thought for very long before the other absurdity of my circumstances overtook me. Each time I recovered, a new dimension of this tragedy invaded my mind and brought with it other spasms of sobs. Mary is going to be sent away by Joseph. Matthew 1 says Joseph is planning to send her away to divorce her. They're betrothed, they're not married yet, but um, betrothal back then is way more serious than our form of engagement. And so they have to send a certificate of divorce to break off that betrothal. And Joseph's going to do that because if Mary had been unfaithful, then she could be stoned to death and Joseph loves her and doesn't want that to happen to her. And so he wants to send her away secretly so that she would live, but he doesn't want to be with her anymore. And that's when Matthew chapter one, verse 20 through 23, the angel Gabriel shows up and says, no, it's true. And then Joseph takes Mary to be his wife. He doesn't have her stoned. He doesn't divorce her. And in fact, 
by taking her to himself and saying she did not commit adultery, she was not unfaithful, he jumps into the scandal with her because now he's saying, no, 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 she wasn't unfaithful. She didn't cheat on me. Everybody's going to look and say, yeah, but she's pregnant. So you must have been uh, immoral before you got married. Joseph voluntarily subjects himself to any misunderstanding the community would have had about Mary's pregnancy. It's another beautiful foreshadowing of the hope that was born in Jesus Christ, an innocent man, Joseph, taking on the guilt of another. What humility only to be outdone by his own son. I think Mary went to Elizabeth to say, this might destroy my relationship with Joseph and I don't know what to do. Not only am I afraid, but I'm also I'm also sad. I'm filled with sorrow over the the fracture in our relationship. Maybe Elizabeth said, Mary, I know that this is going to be painful. I know it might mean losing friendships, relationships, close relatives, but God will never leave you through this. He's there even now walking with you. Maybe she quoted Psalm 23. Even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to be afraid because God is with you and his rod and his staff will comfort you. Mary, be comforted in the midst of the pain. But it's not just sorrow that Mary would have wrestled with and struggled with. It's joy that she wanted to share with somebody. And that leads to number four. So Mary goes to Elizabeth, I believe, because she wants somebody who would understand what's going on. She would want to be with somebody who could give peace in the midst of fear. She wants to be with somebody who can give comfort in the midst of sorrow. And she wants to be, number four, with someone who will rejoice with the joy that she is experiencing. She wants somebody who's going to rejoice with the joy that she is experiencing. There's a lot that Elizabeth knows. We remember Zechariah was already mute, but he's not uh, unable to write. He's been writing things down for Elizabeth, telling her this is what's happening. Isn't this incredible? Even prenatal John the Baptist gets a kick out of Mary's arrival. And so Elizabeth does as well. Luke wants us to catch the, the sheer joy of this moment when they get together. Blessed are you among women. She cries out with a loud voice in verse 42. How is this happening? This is amazing. Blessed is the one who believed that this is going to happen just the way that God said. If the age of redemption is going to mean deliverance from enemies, life without fear, decisive forgiveness of sins, how could Elizabeth remain calm? There's a thrill of hope, a thrill over redemption. So I think maybe Elizabeth with tears in her eyes says, Mary, do you understand what our boys are going to do? Do you get what's going to happen here? My son is going to pave the way for your son. My son's going to tell the world that your son's the Messiah. And then your son is going to save us. How cool is this, Mary? So Mary wants somebody who will rejoice. Imagine that conversation. Imagine at the dinner table. Poor Zachariah, right? Just wanting to jump in and speak. No, just writing something down. And I, I just picture as he's writing it down, Mar Mary and Elizabeth are talking and he wants to interject something, but he can't speak. So as he's writing it down, Elizabeth says it and he just... And then they're talking and he wants to write something else down. And then Elizabeth says it anyway. He just can't get a word in, can't write it down. Imagine Elizabeth saying, Mary, your son is the fulfillment of the promise given to Adam and Eve. God promised them there was going to be one who was going to come and crush the serpent's head. Your son is the snake crusher. Uh, unbelievable moment. He's the one who's going to come and make all things right. I think Mary goes to Elizabeth to find all of those aspects and so many more of companionship. So I want us to just stare at the majesty of companionship. What a gift. We are told in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice. And that's why Mary runs to be with Elizabeth. She wants to be with somebody who will do that for her. Interesting to note also the age gap here. Yes, they're family, but interesting to note the age gap. Mary's probably around 15. Elizabeth is probably around 60. So that makes Elizabeth four times as old as Mary. 
But look at the fellowship, regardless of the age difference. Some of our best fellowship occurs when we defy the segregation of age groups. I wonder if if you're here this morning and you need an Elizabeth in your life. Maybe there's somebody in our church that you, you need to run to today to say, I have sorrow that I need help bearing. And I know you will weep with me. Maybe there's somebody in our church or maybe outside of our church that you know you can run to with joy in your heart, rejoicing and say, will you rejoice with me? Maybe you need an Elizabeth or maybe you have a Mary in your life. Somebody that you need to go to, to bear their burdens with them, to give them assurance, to give them hope, to counsel them, to point them to the greatest hope that we have. So I want us to see in this text the majesty of companionship, the great gift that fellowship is. But don't just stop at looking at the majesty of companionship here, the fellowship that we have with one another. Don't just stop at the companionship that we have with brothers and sisters. Let us always point one another to Christ, our greatest companion. So yes, look at the majesty of companionship, but look at the majesty of Christ. Just think about everything Mary was wanting to find in Elizabeth. You and I have all of that and so much more with Christ. He is somebody who understands everything that we're going through. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in all things, just like we are yet without sin. We have somebody who understands more so than Elizabeth ever could have understood Mary. We have somebody who understands. He's sympathetic. And he wants us to come to him and talk to him. We have somebody who gives peace in the midst of fear. Remember what Isaiah chapter 9 tells us. He is going to be the prince of peace. He's the one who reigns with peace to distribute peace to all of his citizens. We have somebody who will give comfort in the midst of sorrow. He is the wonderful counselor. If you're here and you are in the midst of sorrow, you have someone you can go to. Maybe in this church, a brother or sister you can go to, but you have somebody in this church that will point you to Christ who is better than everyone in this church. I think sometimes we stop, when we look at fellowship, we think fellowship with one another is so amazing, such a gracious gift, and we stop here and we we say, this is enough. Brothers and sisters, we are not Jesus. And so when somebody comes to us and we get to bear their burdens, we better be telling them all the way through that bearing of their burden, you don't need me, you need Jesus. So let's go to Jesus together. He's the wonderful counselor, not me. He will give you comfort in the midst of sorrow. He's going to rejoice with you in your joys. He's our mighty God who gives us the victory. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and the shame. He knows what it is to fight for joy, to find joy, to have joy. And he wants to celebrate our joy with us. He's everything that we need. He's so much more than we could ever be to one another. He's the one that we need. And Christmas reminds us, not only is he the one that we need, Christmas reminds us he's the one that we can run to. Mary, when she gets the news, runs to Elizabeth. I wonder about you. When you get news, when you receive that phone call, when you are with a friend and you experience something that you never thought you'd go through, who do you run to? I think sometimes we don't run straight to Jesus. We run to a friend because I think we feel that that friend might be able to understand better than Christ. Christmas reminds us that Jesus is many things, but two things specifically for us. Christmas reminds us that Jesus is gloriously approachable. What could be less scary than a newborn baby with his limbs swaddled tightly next to his body? I was just thinking about this at our Christmas party on Friday watching Sergio walk in with little Owen, little blanket over, you know, the little crib thing, see him, he's just, he's just there. What could be, what could be less scary than that? That was our savior. That was our savior in a manger, just a little baby, helpless. In Jesus, God found a way of relating to human beings that involved no fear whatsoever. I don't know if you've ever had fish in an aquarium at home. Anybody ever had an aquarium with fish? If you have saltwater fish, you need to keep them in a saltwater tank. You have to run this 
uh, portable chemical laboratory to monitor nitrate levels and ammonia content. You have to pump in vitamins to make sure that they're safe, antibiotics and sulfa drugs and enzymes, uh, enough enzymes that you can make like rocks grow in your aquarium. You have to filter water through glass fibers and charcoal. And you have to expose the water to ultraviolet light to make sure that it's okay for the fish to swim in. It's just this crazy chaotic scene. And you would think after you spend all that energy and all that money and all that time, you would think that these fish would adore you, right? They would just be jumping for joy out. Thank you, thank you. Never, not so. They're not thrilled by your presence. Every time your shadow looms over the aquarium, they run away and hide. They're terrified of you. Even when you're bringing them food, you're like, here, I'm giving you food. You need me. They're terrified. Every time you show up, they think you're going to torture them. There's nothing you can do to convince them that you love them, that you care about them, that you're concerned for them. To your fish, you are deity. You're too large for them. Your actions are too incomprehensible. Your actions of mercy seem like actions of cruelty. Your actions of healing look like attempts to destroy the only way that you could help them understand, make them understand is if you could become a fish, jump into the tank and speak to them and say, I'm the guy and I'm not trying to kill you when I look at you. I think you're beautiful. I love you. I wish I could hang out with you. And as crazy as that sounds, to become a fish and enter an aquarium to talk to your fish, that's nothing compared to God becoming a baby. And yet, according to the Gospels, that's exactly what happened. In a little manger in Bethlehem, the God who created matter itself took shape within it, like an artist might become a spot on their painting, or a playwright might become a character in their own play. Just think about what God the Father must have felt that night, watching his son emerge smeared with blood all over his face with a cold wind hitting his body. That's my son born for us. We sing songs like the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Yeah, right. No way. But we also sing songs that say the hope and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Right there in a little manger. Our Savior is gloriously approachable. But Christmas also reminds us that our Savior, our Savior is lovingly humble. He's not only gloriously approachable, you can run to him. But when you do run to him, he will lovingly and humbly accept you and hold you. One commentator says, the God who roared who could order armies and empires about like pawns on a chessboard. We've seen that in the book of Daniel. This God emerged in Palestine as a baby who could not speak or eat solid food or control his bladder. And he depended on a teenage couple for shelter, food, and love. J.B. Phillips, an old pastor, attempted to capture this mystery of God becoming flesh to love us in kind of a, um, a story-esque way. He, he wrote a narrative of a senior angel talking to a very young angel about the splendors of the universe, just taking him around the whole galaxies of the universe. He saw all these different whirling galaxies and blazing suns, and they flew across infinite distances of space until they came to one particular galaxy of over 500 billion stars. And J.B. Phillips writes this, quote, the two angels drew near to a star, which we call our sun, and to its circling planets. And the senior angel pointed to a small and rather insignificant sphere, turning very slowly on its axis. It looked as dull as a dirty tennis ball. And the little angel whose mind was filled with the size of the glory that he had just seen said, I want you to watch that one particular. The, the senior angel said, I want you to watch that one particularly pointing with his finger to the dirty tennis ball. The little angel said, it looks really small and rather dirty to me. What's so special about it? To the little angel, earth didn't seem impressive at all. He listened in stunned disbelief as the senior angel told him that this planet, small and insignificant and not overly clean, 
was the renowned visited planet. That's what J.B. Phillips calls it. This is the visited planet. The little angel says, do you mean that our great and glorious prince went down in person to this fifth rate little ball? Why should he do a thing like that? The little angel's face wrinkled in disgust. Do you mean to tell me, he said, that he stooped so low as to become one of those creepy crawly creatures on that floaty ball? I do, the other angel responded. And I don't think he would like you calling them creepy crawling creatures in that tone of voice. For as strange as it may seem to us, he loves them. And he went down to visit them, to lift them up, to save them. The little angel looked back. Such a thought was almost beyond his comprehension. God who knows no before or after entered into time and space. God who knows no boundaries took on the shocking confines of a baby's skin. Paul would write later that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creature, uh, all, all creation. In Christ, uh, is, he's before all things. Uh, in him, all things hold together. But the few eyewitnesses that were there on that Christmas night saw none of that. They saw an infant struggling to work his never before used lungs. Brothers and sisters, never do we have to wonder ever again if God loves us. We don't ever have to wonder that ever again. Look at what he did to rescue us. He is gloriously approachable. He is lovingly humble. He is the one that we can run to today. Just like Mary ran to Elizabeth and shows us the majesty of companionship, I want us to run to Christ because of the majesty that we find in him. So I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what this last year has held for you. I don't know what you feel as you enter into the Christmas season. Maybe this last year, it was full of joy. And you can run to Jesus, gloriously approachable, and say, will you rejoice with me? as the giver of all of the good gifts that I can rejoice in. Maybe this last year was hard for you. Maybe I know that we've dealt with loss in our church family. Maybe you lost a loved one, a relative, a friend. Run to Jesus today to find the majesty of companionship in Christ. The one who will bear your sorrows. He is the almighty in a manger. He would be no stranger to all of our sorrows, all of the hurt that we have ever known and will ever know. He is the one who came down to find us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. But my friends, I pray that as we meditate on Christmas, we would see the the beauty of Christ and the amazing reality of his love for you and for me. Born for the purpose of dying, dying for the purpose of rising, rising from the dead to ascend into heaven, to be our high priest forevermore, to take our sins away, to give us eternal life, and to be our friend both now and forevermore. Father, we thank you for this incredible news. It is good news. It is gospel news. You are so amazing. And so I pray that as we meditate on this text, as we meditate and just confirm all these realities to our own hearts, that your spirit would remind us, even now as we meditate through uh, listening to this song, that you would remind us we have a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, a prince of peace, an everlasting father. We have the great I am right next to us. May we run to him now as the one who can bear all of our sorrows, all of our joys, who understands and is our Savior. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.